Welcome everybody to the November you Weekend Reason webinar series. So happy you're here. And uh, we have a fantastic speaker for tonight, Mr. <clears throat> Gavin McClenahan. Uh, but first, I'm afraid I have some housekeeping to do. So I'm going to share my screen. And uh, <clears throat> get underway. So again, welcome to the Weekend Reason webinar. The name of Gavin's presentation is The Power of Stories. And I just realized how important that was. Yesterday I saw an article about um, how we love storytelling so much that it builds societies and tears them down. So Gavin has really hit the nail on the head as far as his presentation, and we are looking forward to it. But first, some housekeeping. We want to say that we are an inclusive community of atheists, humanists, skeptics, and secular free thinkers, and we welcome people of all backgrounds and identities. We have never had any disruptive attendees at our events, and with your help, we intend to keep this record. So please be courteous, as I'm sure everyone will. Now, all of our webinars are free. However, we do have some expenses. We have to pay for Meetup, Zoom, the webpage. So we would appreciate donations. And again, just any amount that you could give will be appreciated. <clears throat> There's a link in the chat that will show you uh, where to donate or <clears throat> here's the link. And also you can go to the ASC webpage and click on the donate button. Also, um, anyone who isn't a member could become a member for just $20 a year. <clears throat> and that gives you uh, the ability to be active in the society. Everybody's more than welcome to volunteer. And <clears throat> also you can go to the website and join there. <clears throat> now, we're going to have a Q&A at the end after Gavin is finished. And the way I'm gonna try to do it is ask you to uh, use the hand raising icon and then we will call on people and you unmute yourself when you're called on and ask your question. And you can find the icon by <clears throat> clicking on the reactions button below. And I'd also ask that after you've asked your question, please lower your hand. Okay. And so <clears throat> now I'm going to, uh, well, stop sharing for a moment, but then I'm going to call on Gavin and turn it over to him. Well, thank you very much. Let me just pull this up. Come on, uh-oh, it's not letting me. Okay. There we go. All right, I hope everyone can see. Yes. Thank you for attending. Okay. Uh, yeah, like Lois said, let's just get to the end and we will uh, have questions at the, the backside here. So the power of stories, and I'm using the 737 MAX disasters as an example. So agenda, tell you a bit about who I am, why you should and should not believe what I tell you about uh, technical matters like this what I hope you get out of this, and then discuss the 737 MAX disasters. There were two crashes. I'm gonna tell two stories that cover both of those crashes. One of them, short, the other, long. Tell you the resolution, and then we'll have a bit of a guided uh, discussion at the end. So who am I? Uh, I'm a civil engineer, so nothing to do with aviation. This is just something I was interested in, and I did a bit of a deep dive. And this occupied a huge chunk of the last three weeks of my life because I just go down all the rabbit holes. So thank you for giving me a reason to do this. I, I hope to not subject you to three weeks worth of talking. 
But uh, part of my history is I worked with the Alberta Energy Regulator for 19 years. And in those 19 years, a big chunk of that was dealing with participant involvement requirements. And those are requirements that companies have to do to talk to the public and landowners about a, an energy development project prior to getting approval. When you talk to people about these things, uh, there's misunderstandings, there's uh, signed up for things you don't, uh, didn't, uh, didn't anticipate, there's objections, concerns, and people who could be directly and adversely affected uh, get to participate in the decision-making process. So a lot of my work was helping those various technical disciplines that were involved in the project understand both each other and to be understood by those without a technical background, like farmers, landowners, ranchers, that sort of thing. So I think I can do, I have done some of this, but uh, I have to have a very deep understanding of my topic in order to do it. Hence my, you know, I have not gone outside in three weeks and I've been doing a whole bunch of wiki walking. But what do I hope you get out of this? I would like you to come away with a confidence that you can understand highly technical manner, matters in a way that's meaningful to you. So airplanes are likely the most complicated, highest level of consequence for a failure technology that the average person is likely to encounter in their regular life. So we need to rely on expertise to enjoy these benefits of modern society and the regulation of airplane safety is incredibly well set up to find the truth and continually make improvements. But that doesn't mean we can't question or understand. Uh, we're skeptics, right? So my thesis here is that we, as humans, are hardwired for stories. We can use this superpower to wrap our heads around complicated matters. There's something I was told a while ago. It said, the process of learning is taking something new and attaching it to what you already know. So a, a benefit of a story is to uh, take something new and tie it to your life, something that already has some meaning and significance to you. So I hope you come away with this with an idea on how to confidently gather information and organize facts so you can understand these technical matters. Of course, I'm not setting myself up to be uh, uh, a first-rate storyteller, so we'll see how successful I am. So first, the disasters. Uh, Air, Lion Air Flight 610, it was a 737 MAX 8. It was, what, two and a half months old. It took, took off and 13 minutes later, it crashed into the Java Sea. The uh, all 189 passengers and crew died. So a new airplane, two and a half months old, uh, crashed very shortly after takeoff. And it hit the ground hard. There were not big pieces left over. This is the uh, Indonesian Navy that had picked up the wreckage. And this is a sample of what was left afterwards. Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302, again, the 737 MAX 8. It was delivered in November and it crashed on March 10th, six minutes after takeoff. So a four and a half month old plane and it similarly uh, crashed very quickly after takeoff. And again, all 157 passengers and crews died. And, and again, there was the, the wreckage was very harsh and there were not a lot of large pieces left. Um, NASA hosts a website where pilots can anonymously report any odd things that happened in the flights. And this is uh, a useful thing for uh, aircraft uh, safety regulators to see what's going on. Pilots get to report stuff anonymously so no one has to know who did it but the, the regulators get good information. So it's kind of hard to, to filter through all of this and what was related to the, the same 737 MAX incidences. Uh, but a reporter from the Atlantic published an article March 13th and sorted through hundreds of issues that seemed, or filtered it down to hundreds of issues that seemed somewhat related. And there was four to six that seemed to be pretty close to what was going on in these two crashes. 
And again, this was reported prior to the investigations being complete. So, so we had two crashes and a number of other incidences that related to the 737 MAX ass disasters. So Ethiopian's flight crashed on March 10th. Uh, 52 federal regulators uh, grounded the 737 MAX from their airspace prior to the US FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, grounding them. And this is unusual because the FAA is the country of initial manufacturer approval. So normally, uh, the country of initial manufacturer approval, that regulator would like to, is generally the first to say, uh, investigate the problems, know what the answers are, and issue these directives to ground it. Uh, the FAA took until May, March 18th to ground all 387 MAX aircraft that were in service at that time. So, so fallout from that, as of January 2020, Boeing had kept manufacturing new aircraft, new 737 MAX, but they can't fly them, and the airlines don't want to take uh, possession of them until the issue has been found out and resolved, and if there's anything that's faulty with the aircraft corrected. So it took until, sorry, it took until November 18th, 2020 for the FAA to, to end that 20 month long grounding. And that is the longest grounding of ever, any US manufactured airliner ever. And just as a side note, China was the first to ground the 737 MAX. And as of August this year, which is the, the soonest I could find any information, uh, it is still grounded in China. So what caused the 737 MAX crashes? I'm going to tell two stories, both true. Uh, as per the what you signed up for here, the first story will be short, uninteresting, and leave you wondering why the planes were grounded for 20 months. The second will be long, full of twists and seeming unrelated facts, and give you the sense the crashes were inevitable. At least this is what I'm sign myself up to do. We'll see how successful I, I end up being. So the first story, and this is the first story in, first, in four points. There's an angle of attack sensor that's on the pilot side of the 737 MAX planes. It either was faulty or failed. A computer system on board called the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, MCAS, interpreted the sensor reading as the plane's being planes nose being up too far. Yeah, sorry. And in order to prevent a stall con condition, MCAS took control of the plane and directed the nose down. And nose down is what a pilot is supposed to do when it's a, when the plane is approaching a stall condition. So you trade height for speed. It maintains and increases that speed, and then you can keep the aircraft controllable. And in both cases, the pilots failed to regain control of the planes from the MCAS. So that's true. Four points, one PowerPoint slide. Just take a moment to note any questions you have and how satisfied that story left you. But you've signed up for a story, so get comfortable. And I'm hoping this one will leave you much more satisfied. First part. The 737 came from a much different era than what we're, it's currently operated in and what we're currently familiar with. This is Boeing's first airplane built in 1916. And it, Boeing was obviously a successful company. It survived till now, but at the start, it wasn't really anything that made it stand out against all the dozens of other manufacturers in those early years. But Boeing quickly, but what Boeing was successful, and this is the Boeing 247, first flew in 1933, and it is technologically significant. Passenger plane, but only 75 of these were made. There wasn't a big market for it. This is the Boeing 314 Clipper, first flew in 1938, one of the largest aircraft of its time. It could cross the Atlantic uh, or the Pacific Oceans, I'm assuming stopping in Hawaii. 12 were built. Boeing made niche aircraft 
that was for passenger flight for very rich people. Then World War II happened. So the B-17 Flying Fortress, shown here, first flew in 1935, and 12,731 of these were made for the US military. The B-17 was the US's largest bomber in the European theater of war. And the US did daylight bombing raids over Germany while the entire rest of the Commonwealth nations ran nighttime raids. So the US, uh, this wasn't their only bomber, but it was the biggest. And that's for the European theater. In order to uh, go to war with Japan, the B-17 could not get to Japan from anywhere, any US territory. So Boeing was tasked with designing an even bigger plane, the B-29 Super Fortress. So it could carry more bombs, go further, and 3,970 of these were made. Post-World War II, Boeing made 742 of these B-52 bombers, an icon of the Cold War era. And these were built between 1954 and 1963. These first flew in 1955, and the US Air Force still has 78 of them, and with plans to keep flying them until at least 2045. That's one plane design that will be used in the military uh, for 90 years, and these have not been built since 1965. So that, so that the B-52 has continually found a role despite all that's changed in the 66 years since it first flew, testament to how versatile it is. So all these air, military aircraft are significant. They're important and have become culturally iconic. While Boeing made, uh, did make passenger aircraft, they were for a very niche market. For example, you might not have heard about this. Boeing's niche is in the passenger market is big, luxurious. This is a Boeing 377 Stratocruiser. It's based on the B-29 Super Fortress. And these were noted for being exceptionally luxurious and were used in regular flights that could take passengers right around the world, going east or west, stopping in all the major cities. And these are double-decker planes that have a mass maximum passenger complement of 50. So there were only 56 of these planes made. So, uh, but Boeing broke into the civilian market in a big way at the dawn of the jet age. This is a Boeing 707. And this came out in 1956. It certainly wasn't the first passenger jet. It wasn't the only one that was operating at the time and not the only one to do this, uh, to participate in the jet age or kick it off. But, Many, true, many people consider the Boeing 707 to be the iconic aircraft of that, uh, the dawn of the jet age. So Boeing made 865 of these 707s between 1956 and 1978. Uh, 707 began service on the New York to London route in 1958, and that was the first year that more transatlantic pattern, passengers traveled by air than, tra pa uh, than traveled by ship. So four engines, lots of power to carry passengers along with the fuel necessary on long distance flight, high up above the turbulence and get there quickly. Much of the world became accessible within a day's travel. And I don't think we can understand just how big of a revolution this is right now. The jet age was everywhere, cultural influences. 1950s cars had you know, fins that were part of the jet age and, and design cues that were based on jet engines, jet engine, uh, jets, uh, design cues put lavishly put on the cars. And a lot of this was just to ride the, the technological coattails and the allure of the jet age. But it wasn't just technology. People seem to, one of the things that you might be able to recall is if you look at James Bond films, yes, there was the manly man doing manly things in, and having cool gadgets to play around with, but a big part of all of the films was the locations. And if you look at the James Bond locations over the years, you're coming up with a lot of the uh, destinations that really define the jet set lifestyle. This is a... Uh, uh, an airline map from Pan American in 1968, I believe. 
And you can see that their routes take you from major city to major city. So this is the basis for that jet set lifestyle of the rich and famous, spending time between stylish and exotic locations, New York, London, Paris, Hawaii, Mexico City, uh, Rio de Janeiro, Athens, Madrid, Rome, Vienna, Bangkok, Hong Kong, Tokyo, all of those places that, that people, uh, yeah, yeah, all of those people, places that fire the imagination. This is where the paparazzi followed the rich and famous to show their lifestyles and, and give people a tantalizing taste of what it's like. So today, if you hear the song lyrics, leaving on a jet plane, don't know when I'll be back again, we might be thinking, well, you're, you're heading up to Fort McMurray. Will you be back tonight, tomorrow, end of the week? But when Don, John Denver sang that song in 1966, it likely in, conjured up the image of heading to Europe or India and spending months there. This is a 1966 American Airlines systems map. So we've kicked off the jet age. And if you look at this map, and, and it isn't completely fair, but from a practical everyday standpoint for travel, it's a matter of traveling to the major airport, jetting to another major airport, and then traveling to your just destination from there. So there's a lot of travel in between the hubs. So Boeing was approached by United Airlines, American Airlines, and Eastern Airlines saying they wanted a smaller plane than the 707 so they could develop, uh, so they could serve smaller cities with shorter runways and fewer passengers. Mer uh, United Airlines wanted a four engine because it's, it had a major hub in Denver. American Airlines, which was operating the four engine 707 requested a twin engine because two engines are more fuel efficient than four. And Eastern Airlines wanted a third engine for its overwater flights to the Caribbean. So at the time, two engine aircraft were restricted from flying anywhere that took them further than a 60 minute flying time on one engine to the nearest airport. So it was quite restricted. So Boeing came up with a trijet design, the three engines, one, two, and the third on the other side. And that fit that smaller market bill. So uh, the 727 was built from 1963 to 1984 with 1,832 made. And that was a record for any passenger jet up until that point. And it held that until the 737 actually exceeded it. But when you look at where the 737 comes on the drawing board at Boeing, Finally, we get into the 737. It gets on the drawing board in 1964 because Boeing thinks that there's gonna be a market for smaller jet planes. And it starts designing something tiny, 50, 60 feet, uh, 60, 50 to 60 seats for people. And it was nicknamed the baby Boeing. And it's kind of uh, a derisive term because Boeing is known for the big aircraft, multiple engines, all of that, and this, the baby Boeing. So what's its place? So saying that the 737 was going to be a runaway success is like, if you could travel back in time to 1984 and talk to the board of directors at Apple Computers, and you told them, I know you make desktop computers now, but in 25 years time, you're gonna dominate the phone market. They would think, damn, we're going to fall a long ways. So the first 737 flew in 1967. While it was on the drawing board as a 50 or 60 seat plane, by the time it was under serious development, it was planned as a 103 seat plane. And that in 1965, airliner Lufthansa, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing things right, ordered 21 of them, kicked it off. And a few months later, United ordered 40 of them, but wanted Boeing to stretch it out to accommodate 115 passengers. So these became the first two 737, uh, the original models, the 100 and 200. And just to give you a feel of how different an era it was, when Boeing launched its first 737 as a publicity stunt, it invited stewardesses from the 17 airlines that had placed an order for the 737 to come to, to Seattle to christen it. And I'm just going to let you think about 
how much of a different time this photo captures. But there's something else that's important context from that era that the 737 was designed in. If, you've, if I've lost you up to this point, you can catch up with this one photo. This photo captures the origin of the 737 MAX problems. At the time, it was an advantage to have the 737 low to the ground, it made it much easier to load passengers and baggage. Almost no airports had jetways. And certainly, and the 737 was designed to fly to smaller airports that certainly didn't have them. So low to the ground meant that the passengers had to walk up fewer steps to get into the airplane. This was a selling feature at the time. So jet travel is it taking off and it's not clear that the 737 has a significant role at this point. However, perhaps surprisingly, the jet 737 becomes the plane that becomes the go-to workhorse for most of the flying, certainly Boeing's offering of the workhorse. But a lot of smart money is going a different direction than the 737. In 1965, Pan Am Airlines president approached Boeing with a request to build an airplane that can carry two and a half times the number of passengers that the 707 could. Uh, various models of the 747 can carry between 276 and 467 passengers. So Boeing started designing the 747 and it first flew in 1969, a year after the 737 debuted. So there was a lot of smart money that was saying that the solution to crowded airports is bigger airplanes, not smaller. Some airlines apparently bought these jets just for the prestige and because they, they would look like they were not playing in the big leagues if they didn't have one. There's definitely been a market for these and variants are still being made. And as of September of this year, 1,556 have been made and it's still being produced but production's gonna end shortly. Now the 747 has also kicked off another era. This is the 737, the same configuration as the 707, the, uh, the 727, and yes, the 737. It's a narrow body, one aisle. So one aisle limits you to uh, six across seating. One, people don't wanna be packed into even uh, like sardine-like, even more than that. But two, one aisle uh, limits the amount of time it or congests the getting passengers on and off the plane and especially evacuation in an emergency. And there are time constraints that airline have to meet to get passengers off planes. The 747, in, uh, in contrast, has two aisles. You might not be able to see the one very clearly on the left-hand side but there's one here on the pretty, pretty much straight and forward. So this says, instead of six across, it has three, three, and four, so 10 across. So more cabin space, it gives passengers more of a feeling of, of space, maybe not in this coach configuration, but in other configurations. And there's more cargo room. And again, the loading and unloading and evacuating passengers, uh, both regularly and an emergency makes the wide body a benefit. And all of a sudden, all of Boeing's previous planes are really one class. 707, 727, and 737 all share that same cabin cross section. FYI, 148 inches of diameter. Six across narrow, narrow bodies. Uh, six across seating, narrow body aircraft. They all just vary by length and wing design and amount of fuel they can hold. But basically uh, the length and passenger capacity is basically their, their distinction. And in 1982, Boeing released the 757, direct replacement to the 727. Again, same cross section, narrow body airplane. But when you look at the planes, the 747 with all the previous planes, you can see that they're a distinct different class. This is a 747 in the background and an original 707 in the foreground. <clears throat> and this was the big airplane at the time. Similarly, 747 in the background and a 737 in the foreground, different class of airplane. And Boeing didn't abandon that narrow body 
It uh, this is the 757 started make yeah started being produced in 1983, but production ended in 2005. 1,050 where these were made. It's a success, but it's nowhere near the class of the 737 success. Even it, 757 compared to the 747. When I look at these pictures, all of these uh, 707, 27, 37, 57, they all look like the same plane in comparison to the 747. And because I'm an engineer, I like charts. So this is a picture to me, it counts as a picture. I said pictures, I promised pictures, got it. So this is all those narrow body uh, passenger jets that were produced by model for the, by Boeing. So 707, 27, 57, and 37. So all of those ones, they get produced and then they level off when they stop being produced, cumulative. The uh, 727, very popular. 757 does not get very high, 1,000 produced. But the 737 has been ramping, ramping up, and it is the most popular Boeing narrow body plane by far. Even when you compare it to the wide body planes, all of these wide body planes down here are the individual wide body models. Green is the total of Boeing's wide bodies. So the 737 is still produced twi in twice the numbers that all of the wide bodies are done. And Boeing got trapped by the 737 success. 707, last produced in 94, 727 is 84, 757, they stopped producing it in 2005. 737 is now the only narrow body passenger jet that Boeing makes. And it's the, they're reliant on uh, their, a big chunk of their income on a 50 year old basic design. So part one came from a different era, part two, Suddenly Boeing has a runaway success, but they're kind of trapped with it. Part three, why was this a success? Remember this 1966 uh, Air, American Airlines flight routes map? The industry is in a state of flux. While flights were expensive, there were a few hub airports that would gather up large number of passengers and take them to another hub airport. Lots of travel to get to the hubs, and lots of trouble from the hubs to the, your final destination. And it remained and has remained that the backbone of the jet, passenger jet industry is to have these large jets that can take long distances and go to hubs. But there's another way to decongest airports besides larger planes make the airports bigger. The airport routes are going from something that looks like this in 1966 to something that looks like this today. And I know you might have to look real close here, but, but there are lots of small and medium sized destinations and this is just Delta. So as flying became cheaper, more people could afford to fly, the more economical it came to fly, more people wanted to, and there was more of a demand to go right directly from mid-size airport to another mid-size airport. The bigger the plane, the more efficient it can be, but that is contingent on the plane being full or nearly so. And a flight costs the airline pretty much the same for, an air, for an, a given aircraft type, whether it is full or empty. So the 707, it was superseded by the 747 and it needed large airports to land. Uh, it also had to have ground power supplied or have an engine running while it was on the ground. So it's a lot of plane for short flights and it just didn't find a home. 727, again, very successful uh, airplane and it had the range to get basically between any two points within the continental US. And it's suited to smaller airports that can't handle the 707 or 747. Plus the three engines means it's not restricted to being within that 60 minute one engine flying time to an airport. The two engines are restricted to. So this is a pretty versatile aircraft for smaller airports. And again, 1984 was the last one of the 1832 of these that rolled off the assembly line. Highest production aircraft at the time. 
but the 727 was a loud plane and three engines are more expensive to buy, maintain and operate. And in 1972, uh, Boeing was forced to meet new noise requirements, 727 being loud. And on top of all of that, this engine design, while they could put larger, more efficient engines on the two outsides, the one top center engine, it's kind of built into the aircraft and it does not lend itself to being upgraded. So the 757 seems to follow the, the right formula. The air, the engines under the wings, they're bigger than that first generation. And it's comparable in size to the 727. So while it's successful, the 1050 made, uh, it couldn't compete to, with the 737 for reasons that verge onto speculation. And I'm gonna speculate. Uh, 737 has a very good basic design. Two engines, that's important. Fewer engines mean better fuel economy. They are easier to maintain two rather than three, easier, cheaper to buy two rather than three. three. And fuel economy, two engines are more fuel eco economical. And it's not just the, the price of burning fuel that goes into economy. If you have to haul up fuel into the air, that's cargo that you can't, paying cargo that you can't get into the air. Uh, the 737 was also being the baby Boeing and not a serious airplane, it was flown by two pilots without the need for a flight engineer. So uh, to fly this plane, you had the two professionals as opposed to the three professionals that the other aircraft cross. That six across seating seems to be into that magic sweet spot. And the under wing engine placement is very beneficial because if the, the engines are under the wing and not attached to the fuselage, they're further away, so noise and vibrations don't bother passengers as much, and they're closer to the ground, so it makes it engine maintenance easier. And the 737 came available in many lengths, and those lengths tended to grow with each new generation. Original research warning, this is my personal theory, is that this is a chart that shows each model of the 737 being produced. So the year of the mean production is there, the length of the fuselage in meters is on the y-axis and the size of the dot is the number of, uh, number of that model that were produced. So you can see that as time goes by, airlines are buying longer and longer versions of the 737. So my personal theory on all of this, on why the 737 became the, the workhorse of Boeing's in, Boeing's industry is because there's a sweet spot of big enough to be efficient, but small enough to fill for all of those, uh, all of those small mid-size airport to mid-size airport runs that are becoming more and more popular. So while that sweet spot is shifting, it seems to be rather predictable and going with growing with time. So Boeing. My theory, the little baby Boeing is growing up at the same time as the airline industry. And it stays in that shifting sweet spot. So if the demand for the flights that are available exceeds the seats that are available, the airline can sub in a bigger plane, or it can add more departure times, or it can add more routes. Bigger planes are a bigger commitment, while smaller planes are less of a financial commitment and lend themselves to giving customers more choice. The consequence, there's an inertia in the 737 that's probably overtaken the entire industry at that point. So from the, a regulatory standpoint, it's easier to get approval for a new model of an existing aircraft than a whole new model. Uh, if you're upgrading an existing model, the regulators tend to look just at what has changed since the previously approved aircraft, and they only look at that. So it's quicker and cheaper to go through the regulatory approval process. Boeing has a runaway success, so keep going with what works. Airlines know what they're getting, stick with the, stick with the slight improvements because that seems to be low risk, that seems to be where the, the market is going. And maintaining fewer types of aircraft are cheaper. You have to train the mechanics on different, uh, fewer types of engines and whatnot and have fewer spare parts in, in reserve. And hundreds of pilots are already trained on the 737. 
So part four, second mouse gets the cheese. So that's a Boeing, uh, I'll make sure I get this right, seven, that's an Airbus, seven, A320 in the foreground and a Boeing 737 in the background. And if you have to spend a bit of time to tell that those are different aircraft, you and I are not that different. So Boeing figured out where that sweet spot is and anyone can read the recipe to the secret sauce. So Airbus introduced the A320 in 1988 and Boeing showed where that sweet spot was. Airbus just designed to fill it and with more modern and lighter materials and better engines. But remember this photo? Being low to the ground was a benefit when the 737 was first introduced because there were no jetways. These jetways, they're everywhere now. So being low to the ground isn't a benefit and it's actually a hindrance to some of the, the biggest upgrades you can do to an airplane. The upgrades tend to do with engines. So this is an original engine on an original 737. They're small in that they're narrow and long. So between the first and second generation engines, this is what's called the low bypass engine. And for passenger jets, it's far more fuel efficient and more power you get out of a high bypass engine. And the bypass just means how much air is going through the core of the engine versus how much goes around the core. So that's the fan there. How much air does that fan push into the core versus go around. So high bypass engine, a high amount of the air, a high proportion of the air bypasses the core. So bigger engines are more efficient. That's where the technology takes it. But because Boeing was so close to the ground in the beginning, for their classic, the second and third generation, Boeing 737s have this strange shaped engine nacelle called the hamster pouch by whoever calls these things, what names these things. Uh, and in these cases, Boeing worked with the manufacturer of the engines to take an existing engine and redesign them to fit under the wing of the 737. To fit under the wing, parts of the engine were moved to the side, so no big deal there. But also that large fan was made slightly smaller. And the results are the engines made for the 737 737 uh, classic and next gen, the second and third generations, they are less powerful and efficient than the engines it was derived from. So a small sacrifice in power and efficiency, but this doesn't cause problems in these, the second and third generation of 737 engines. It just shows that Boeing is running out of room under the 737 wings. So the 737 Classic has the hamster pouch versus the A320, the original generation, perfectly round engine nacelles. Lots of engine, uh, lots of room underneath the, for the larger engines when the, sorry, the classic generation, second generation of A3737 was released in 1984. And Boeing or Airbus came out with the larger, uh, with the A320 with the larger engines in 1988. So it's got the room. Boeing topped that in, with the 737 next generation or NG in 1997. So again, Boeing has managed to get ahead of Airbus with the engine technology and other things. But again, it's got that hamster hamster pouch engine nacelle. So at this point, Boeing knows that Airbus is kind of ahead. It has a, a more technologically advanced aircraft uh, and it needs a plan to meet that challenge. So in 2006, Boeing starts the 737 replacement with a clean sheet design, a whole new plane. And just for context, remember Boeing uh, pumped out the 747 in 18 months after an airline requested it. So it can work fast. But Airbus is catching up quick. 
This is the total number of aircraft. And blue is the Airbus, 737 is the Boeing 737, eh. yellow is the 737. It's caught up in total number of aircraft produced. But if you go back to, say, before the 1997, when the next generation came out, there's a whole lot of planes from Boeing that are probably not in service. Airbus has more A320s in service than Boeing has 737s. And then, so Boeing has said in 2006 that it's going to make a new airplane. In 2010, Airbus announces the A320neo. So it's the exact same airplane. They're just putting a better engine, a newer, more modern, more efficient engine in there. And it announces what it expects those efficiency and cost savings will be. And this would put it as an impressive leap forward, well ahead of where Boeing is with the 737NG. So even in this, this time, Boeing says, CEO says, we're going to do a new airplane, not re-engine the 737. And March, uh, Boeing CFO says the company is not sure about re-engineering the 737. But then uh, Boeing gets a bit of a kick in the butt here. June 2011, the Paris Air Show, Airbus sells, gets commitments for 667 uh, A320neos. So this makes their backlog orders of over a thousand A320neos since it was announced. And just note, they aren't even built yet. They don't even have a prototype in the air. So July 20. 2011, American Airlines announced an order for 460 narrow body jets, uh, 130 uh, first generation A320s from Airbus, 130 next generation uh, the A320s from Airbus, getting 100 of the older 737 next generation or current engine, uh, current 737s at the time and tells them that they intend to order 100 re-engine 737s. Now note that Boeing hasn't said that it's going to do a re-engine or put new engines on the 737. Uh, I speak a little corporate ease, but I can tell you this is how one company tells another company to pull its head out of its ass and get back into the game. And the first Airbus A320neo is delivered January, 2016. Bad news for Boeing, the A320 Neo is as promised. So now, the end of this, Boeing had the winning formula and it's uh, the competitor has been catching up with a newer, more modern design. Boeing's in trouble. And before I take you to the uh, 737 MAX, uh, we talked about the maneuvering characteristics augmentation system playing a key role in the 737 MAX disasters. So let's just take a slight detour to go there before we go on. Boeing has a lot going on. I'm going to take you on a detour to, to that because it is relevant. This is the K, KC-46 Pegasus mid-air refueling tanker. They're being de developed and uh, have been sold to the U.S. Air Force as we speak. So Max uh, MCAS um, maneuvering characteristics augmentation system wasn't made for the 737. It was made for this. Uh, and this Boeing, this KC-46 is based on the Boeing 767 wide body. And this empty weighs 82 metric tons but it can take off with a maximum weight of 188 tons, including 96 tons of fuel. Let's take a moment to consider what mid-air refueling really is. This is three airplanes in flight with one sending out two boons to touch two other aircraft in a way that doesn't get sucked into an engine or go through the windscreen and then transfer thousands of kilograms of fuel. Formation flying at this level is the stuff of air shows. And that's without upping the skill level and the danger required of passing fuel between one plane and the next. When you refuel a car, you have to come to a complete stop, turn off the engine, and oh, by the way, don't even use your cell phone. Not sure that's still current. 
So this requires some stable precision flying. And to understand the precision part, let's first start with general flying. If you're traveling in three dimensions in an airplane, you need thrust to push you forward. So thrust is supposed to just push you in the direction that the airplane is traveling. And then you also need to have three controls along the three axis that, uh, to control the airplane. So the first one is yaw, which is just spinning the airplane flat. So it's the nose turns left or right. Roll is twisting the nose. So uh, right wing down or right wing up with the left wing doing the opposite. And pitch is rotated around this axis. So it goes nose up or nose down. MCAS helps control pitch, nose up, nose down. And to understand how pitch is done, when you were in normal flight, the pilot would say, pull back on the yoke, and that raises the elevator tabs, the elevators here, just these small parts at the back of the stabilizer. And if the tabs go up, it pushes the back of the plane down and the nose goes up. But if the pilot lets go of the yoke, the plane should want to fly straight and level. You know how when you, uh, you turn a corner in a car, you can release your grip on the steering wheel and the wheels will mostly straighten all out on their own? That's not something that's naturally inherent in cars. It's designed into them. In all the cars we are likely familiar with, this stability is good. Let's us drive straight the majority of the journey with a lower attention and effort, and you only have to really be on when you're turning a corner. In autocross racing, for example, there are no straight sections on a course, and it's a race. So why have your car set up to go straight? If you and I were to drive a car that's set up for autocross racing, we would describe the steering as twitchy and dangerous. But an autocross rider, driver would describe it as responsive and sporty. It's obviously not quite the same thing from cars to planes, but it's kind of analogous. Unless you want a fighter jet or an airplane to perform acrobatics, uh, you would generally want a plane that fly, tends to fly straight and level without being twitchy. And to do that, but getting the plane to fly level without steadily climbing or descending is dependent on three things. How fast is the plane going? What the plane is carrying and how that what it's carrying, the fuel, passengers and cargo, how it's distributed throughout the airplane. So on these big airplanes, here's the elevator tabs here that the pilot uses to make the plane go up or down, the control the pitch. But the combination of how a plane is loaded for each trip is generally you'd expect to be different. So to get the plane to fly straight and level, on large airplanes anyways, the whole stabilizer is moved up and down. So to set it to fly straight, the pilot trims the aircraft and that's moving the whole stabilizer, the whole thing up and down, rotated about here through that distance. So trimming controls the pitch, but instead of manipulating these tiny elevator tabs, the whole thing. Note, please just note how big the whole stabilizer is in relation to the small tabs. Now this is a cutaway of the KC-46, but a passenger jet is supposed to come down with the same cargo and passengers that it went up with, less the fuel that it burnt over the, slowly over the course of the trip. This isn't the same for the KC-46 Pegasus. It comes, it can offload, it is supposed to offload tens of thousands of kilograms of fuel in mid, in mid flight quickly. And where that, that fuel comes from, all of these fuel tanks that are in the aircraft, as well as the ones on the wings, uh, that can be shifted around and it certainly goes down. And you want to have a stable plane, a stable flight while you're refueling. So the role of the MCAS in the Pegasus is to adjust the trim. And remember that's to adjust the, the load of the aircraft. It's part of the autopilot function. And the trim is there when the quantity and distribution of the load of the aircraft is changing. Normal passenger jets 
that is basically this uh, it doesn't change from after you take off to when you land it's just the minor adjustments for the, the fuel tank but mcas is set up for a lot of change in a short period of time but like the uh, the autopilot system uh, in other Boeing aircraft, MCAS turns off if when the pilot takes control. Okay, so that's where the MCAS came from. Now, story is about to pick up here. Uh, designing the 737 MAX. So, Boeing worked with the engine manufacturer to come up with a Again, derated engine for the 737 MAX, and it's derating the engine that Airbus is using in the A320neo. So you might think that the hamster pouch doesn't look any more pronounced than it did in the, in the previous generation, but the engines are moved forward and up to make them fit. These pictures aren't to scale, but really, the two engines are the exact same. And yes, the 1B engine used in the 737 is slightly smaller than the one used in the, the, the NEO. So this is the first time that Boeing isn't able to top Airbus in the engine offering. However, Boeing insists that it has made improvements that put the 737 MAX ahead of the NEO using other tactics and other design things. I wish I could find a better, a higher resolution picture of this because it does a really good job of showing. Up on top here is the 737 next generation and below is the 737 Max. So you, if you look closely at these pictures, in the Max, the engine, the front of it is bare, bare aluminum so it doesn't stand out as much, but you can tell that it is further forward than the engine on the uh, 737 next gen. As well, you can see that the top of the engine here is right in line with the, the wing on the 737 MAX, versus here it's slightly below. So there are, uh, the, the engine configuration is different in order to fit the engines under the 737 MAX. So, 737 MAX, first test flight January 2016. This is the same month as when the first A320neo was delivered. So, and the, the test flight reveals that the MAX has some twitchy handling behavior. In some conditions, the A327 tends to want to nose up. And those conditions are when it's going low speed and high engine thrust, like when you take off. As far as I can gather, this behavior is caused by a combination of where the engine is placed and how the engine nacelles interact with the wings, especially at those low speeds, high thrust situations. Explain something else technical here. Torque. Torque is a twisting force. It is measured as the force applied multiplied by the distance from the axis of rotation. So there's nuts on the wheels, lug nuts holding this down. If you say that this wrench here is two feet long and I put a hundred pounds of force straight down at this point, that's a hundred times two, that would make 200 foot pounds of torque twisting force on that nut. That's probably enough to twist it off and wreck the wheel. However, if I grabbed the wrench along this handle and pushed it straight forward with that same hundred pounds of force, that would be 100 pounds of force times zero distance from the axis of rotation because it's going straight through that, there would be zero twisting force, zero torque applied to the nut. Remember the control here? You want thrust to just push the plane forward in the direction it's facing. But what's happening here is the engine placement and their interference, the engine nacelle interference with the wings is actually having a twist it's torquing on the twist axis and making the plane want to nose up. So, so again, this is kind of a demonstration of it. It pushes the force of the plane up. You tend to want to use the stabilizers to go down, sorry. 
So this is not, it's certainly not ideal, but it isn't the end of the world. The plane just has to act predictably. You would like it to, you would like the thrust to not have any interference in the other flight parts, but lots of planes have it. Not a big deal if you're prepared for it. The plane just has to act predictably. But the critical thing for Boeing at this point is the 737 MAX behaves differently than the 737 Next Gen. And to let you know just how, how much of a, a problem this is with the airplane pitching up too high, let's talk about how an airplane wing works. The airplane is going through the air, uh, going towards the left-hand side of the screen. So if you had a molecule of air that's in this blue line right there, and right beside it is a molecule of air in the red line, they take two different paths, but arrive here at the same time. To get over this longer path, it has to go faster, it spreads out, creates low pressure. To go underneath it, it go, gets, goes slower, gets all bunched up and creates high pressure. So the combination of the sucking under the low pressure and the pressure under the high pressure area pushes the, the wing up. And that works for a while. So normal through flight, you would have something like this. The airflow would stick pretty close to the wing. You tilt it up, the angle of attack of the plane, because the whole plane is attached here. Uh, this would generate more lift because the air going here travels further than the air traveling here, even though because they stay, uh, it's called laminar flow, because they stay stable, they both reach the backside at the same time. But you increase the angle of attack beyond a certain point, stall occurs. And what happens is the air goes over, but it doesn't stick. It just swoops in and kind of swirls around and pushes down. Now, a stall in an airplane is not the same thing as a stall in a car. You, your car engine stalls, you're still moving forward, you can still signal, you can control the, the, the steering wheel, you can pull over to the side of the road, you can apply the brake and stop. You still have control of the, the car. But a stall in an airplane is more analogous to a skid in a car. You have no control. In the, in the car, you're advised to turn into the skid to get your tires to grip the road again, to get your tires rotating in the direction your car is actually traveling, regardless of whether that's the direction you want to go in. And once the tires grab, then you have a chance of regaining control. In a plane, when you are stalling, pilots are advised to turn, pitch the nose down so you can uh, increase the plane's speed you trade height for speed, and more importantly, you get air flowing back over the wings again so you can have control, not uh, have basically a parachute like what's happening when you're in a stall. The critical thing here again, angle of attack. So you measure angle of attack to make sure that you're not going into a stalled condition. So Boeing has motivations at this point. They want to certify the 737 MAX. And again, uh, certification, uh, the cost and time is proportional to the change between the two, uh, the aircraft that's already approved and the changes that the new one has. Their sales pitch has been 737 MAX is simply a performance upgrade to a plane you are already familiar with. And pilots uh, getting them certified, it is not trivial to uh, factor in the time and the cost and the time out of circulation for pilots to get trained on a new aircraft. So you want all of these things, Boeing is motivated to say that the 737 MAX is basically the same plane as the 737 next gen, it's just more efficient. And then Boeing makes the decision to use the MCAS from the KC-46 Pegasus to make the 737 seem to behave like the 737 next generation. So they haven't fixed the problem of the 737 MAX, the new plane. They just want to uh, make it seem like it handles the same way as the 737 next gen. 
Okay. Boeing also decides not to tell anyone else about this. Not the FAA, not the airlines, not the pilots, and not even their own engineers. They're just going to fix the problem and move the plane out. So consequences. Air travel doesn't have its impressive safety record, and I do believe it has a very impressive safety record. It's not because things don't break, airplanes are machines, parts wear out, and they break. Air travel is safe because pretty much anything on a plane can break, and the plane can still be flown safely. Uh, with people not knowing what the MCAS, that the MCAS is there, what it does and how it does it, Boeing isn't even giving their own people a chance to imagine how it might fail, what the consequences of that failure might lead to, and how those consequences can be mitigated. Boeing also appears to have minimized and possibly misled the FAA about the role of MCAS. Meanwhile, the FAA did not clue into what Boeing was doing. It did know about the MCAS, but it didn't seem to pay much attention to it. Remember this photo? When pitching the nose down, the pilot, uh, when pitching the nose down, a pilot is supposed, like a pilot is supposed to do when the plane is going into a stall, the pilot pushes the forward on the yoke, moving these comparatively small elevator trims down, pushing the, the back end up and the nose down. But the MCAS system controls trim, this whole stabilizer. Trim is, and again, Trim is to set the plane to fly straight and level depending on speed, how much it's carrying, and how that load is distributed. And it is made to handle trim for the KC-46 Pegasus with its 96 tons of fuel, most of which can be offloaded in flight. When it's tight, tight flying formation and offloading fuel. So MCAS needs to know what the angle of attack is. And surprise, surprise, uh, it gets that data from an angle of attack sensor. And that's where an angle of attack sensor is on the plane. There's another one directly on the other side. This is what it looks like when it's taken out. So MCAS monitors the plane is nosing up too much when the 737 MAX is flying in the conditions that the 737 MAX behaves differently than its predecessor. And again, these conditions are when the 737 MAX has low airspeed and high thrust, like when it's taking off. So in order to monitor the 737 MAX's angle of attack, it takes data from an angle of attack sensor. Here's another picture of them. The angle of attack sensor works by having the body of the sensor attached to the aircraft and a vane that is pushed around depending on the direction the air is flowing relative to the direction the plane is uh, pointing. So this is like sticking your hand out the car window when it's traveling fast. But instead of you needing to point your hand into the wind or it gets pulled, this is set up so that the wind pulls the, the uh, vane so it's pointing away from, or pointing in the direction of airflow. But these sensors have moving parts. They're outside the plane. They're subjected to be hit by birds or ice, and they're subjected to a heating and cooling cycle with every single flight. They break fairly frequently as air part, airplane parts break. Normally, that's not such a big deal. It just gives a reading. That's one of several readings that's available to the pilot. Like this is the artificial horizon, and that shows that the angle of, atten angle of attack is above the horizon, so it is positive. Additionally, there's separate and independent systems for the pilot and the co-pilot. More than that, if it gets to be, so this is how the pilot normally can, controls it. There's a thumb switch that can power the, power the trim up or down, or there's a manual control, which is turning this wheel. And this wheel is directly connected to the stabilizer trim set. And then there's switches to uh, turn on or off the, uh, <clears throat> the power assist and the autopilot. But here's the thing. These switches 
don't look any different from the 737 Max, the next generation to the 737 Max, but they act different. On the 737 Max, the autopilot can just be turned off, in which case, you know, the 737 Next Gen can autopilot can adjust trim in mid flight to account for fuel um, being burned, et cetera. But on the right hand side, this turns off all power assist to, uh, to, to adjust the trim. So on the 737 Next Gen, you can disable the autopilot from adjusting the trim by just flipping this up. But on the 737 Max, MCAS is not part of the autopilot system. It, uh, it's on all the time. So if you want to turn MCAS off, you have to turn this switch off. And that switch also makes sure that the pilots don't have a power assist in adjusting the stabilizer. So that's different than what pilots are used to. And they're not told about this. This is a good time to talk about differing design philosophies. The A320 has always, and I'm gonna use air quotes here, filtered the pilot's commands through a computer system. The system decides what the pilot wants to do and checks to see if the commands would take the plane outside its flight envelope. The flight envelope for a plane are the conditions that the plane can safely operate it in without losing control or without damaging it. So you can fly outside the envelope by flying too slow and you stall, or you can fly too fast, like in a steep dive, and the plane structurally can't handle it. Airbus uh, filters all pilot commands through a computer that, see, that confirms it's not taking the plane outside the flight envelope. Now, Boeing has, all, has also developed multiple systems that warn the pilot if the plane is going outside its flight envelope. And the systems tell the pilot what is wrong and what, it, what the pilot should do about it. But as far as I can tell, Boeing has never implemented flight rules like, uh, like Airbus that take over from the pilots. In Boeing planes, the planes always do what the pilot commands or has in the past. It certainly has never done this in the 737 family. So this is new and Boeing hasn't even told the pilots about it. This difference in philosophy is, has actually factored into the <clears throat> US Air Force's decision to go with the KC-46 uh, Pegasus because the Airbus plane does have those flight rules and the computer does make sure that the plane stays within the flight, uh, the flight envelope of the, their tanker. And the military's thinking is you're, if you're in a war zone, uh, and the pilot says, I need to get away now. You don't want to be arguing with the computer about how much this shortens the lifespan of the, the airframe when being shot at can shorten it much quicker. And because MCAS was implemented in the 737 and it doesn't seem to even have gone through Boeing's internal checks, MCAS does not have any rationality checks associated with it. So the 737 max envelope for angle of attack, it likely cannot possibly exceed 20 degrees ever. But the angle of attack sensors can measure an angle of attack up to 75 degrees. When the angle of attack sensors fail, MCAS can understand that reading to be the maximum value of 75 degrees. And on the 737 MAX, MCAS was not, to check, uh, not set up to check for agreement between the two angle of attack sensors. Just the one on the pilot side doesn't even, isn't even connected to the one on the co-pilot side. And again, that's different than the KC-46. MCAS was not limited to how much, it can, how much of an adjustment on the trim it can make. So it can use, it has authority to use that full trim adjustment that's available on the 737 MAX. And lastly, MCAS is not limited to how often it can make adjustments. All of these things have factored into uh, the, the accidents that happen. So the 737 MAX with the MCAS goes to market. The FAA wasn't told about how the MCAS was implemented. 
They didn't know it was there. You can say that they didn't ask questions they should have. You can say that it, Boeing hid it from them. There's lots of stories that you can tell within that. The FAA, FAA didn't find out or ask about it, certainly not the way it's implemented. And Boeing sold the 737 MAX as a performance upgrade only. Pilots were certified on the 737 MAX. If, you, if the pilot was certified on the 737 Next Gen, certification for the 737 MAX was 20 minutes on an iPad. I don't know what it was, but it was probably uh, read this bit, watch this video, answer these questions, and that's all it takes for a pilot to be certified for the 737 MAX. Pilots weren't told about the MCAS, and even if they were uh, really keeners and they got a hold of the 737 MAX's manual, it doesn't even mention MCAS. So summary, Boeing has a plane that doesn't behave as desired, decides to deal with the behavior rather than deal with the problem. And it keeps the issue and its solution quiet. And because it's kept quiet, it's, keep, it's kept from being subject to the usual failure modes and effects analysis that is the industry standard. And that's just the, the formal name of imagining how things can fail, what it will cause, and how you can prevent it from being catastrophic. So 737 MAX disasters, just revisit them here. Lion Air, Flight 610. Day prior to the accident, the plane in question did, did experience an MCAS runaway event, i.e. MCAS did adjust the trim inappropriately and far outside of what it should have. The crew reported the incident, but not how it was successfully dealt with you know, i.e. the stabilizer trim to cut, set to cut out and manually adjust the trim for the rest of the flight. That evening, the pilot's side angle of attack sensor was replaced, but it was replaced with an improperly calibrated unit. On October 29th, the last time that, uh, that plane took off from Jakarta, Indonesia, the pilot side angle of attack sensor read 21 degrees more than the co-pilot's angle of attack sensor. And remember that 21 degrees is probably taking it outside the flight envelope as is. So the MCAS acting on that bad data triggered a runaway stabilizer trim scenario, i.e. it kept moving the stabilizer to point the nose down. And every time that the pilots manually adjusted, MCAS resets, takes a few seconds to uh, take in the data, and then it plots or determines that the nose is going up too high, again, because it has bad data, and then triggers another uh, stabilizer trim down. It doesn't do this continuously, but it does it repeatedly and over the course of the whole flight. Three minutes into the flights, when the unusual data started to be reported, and the pilot asked for permission to return to the airport. Flight data shows that the plane changed altitude and speed erratically. It's going up and down. Um, again, going up, slows down, heads down, speeds up. I don't think the pilots actually got control of the, the speed. And it crashed in the into the Java Sea at a higher angle and a high speed just 13 minutes after takeoff. Doesn't seem to be any indications the pilots figured out what the problem was or how, or how to deal with it. Here's a flight profile. So normally this part would just continue on, uh, but they have that dip down three minutes in, seemed to get some control, and then fought it for <coughs> the majority of that time that it was in the air before ultimately losing control rather drastically at the end. So after the Lion Air crash, Boeing sends out a bulletin reminding pilots of the runaway stabilizer trim procedure. It has been there. Uh, there is a procedure that would work on this, but Boeing didn't provide any warning that the MCAS could cause the issue or that this might happen at a different time. Normally, 
uh, runaway stabilizer is when it's in autopilot just cruising, so at altitude. So it still doesn't tell pilots when this emergency might happen. Ethiopian Airlines, uh, they flew out of Ethiopia. Pilot side AO, the angle of attack sensor appears to have been giving accurate readings until shortly after takeoff. So here's a reconstruction of the data. But shortly after takeoff, don't know what happened, whether it was struck by a bird or, or whatever, but it failed. And then MCAS started reading maximum angle of attack. So it thought it was 75 degrees nose up. Physically impossible for the 737 to be like that. The pilots knew of this problem. They had read the bulletin, took the corrective action to, to uh, switch the stabilizer switch to cut out. So take the power off that uh, cuts MCAS right out of the system. But the MCAS had already adjusted the stabilizer for nose down. With the pilot pulling back on the yoke, trying to, to pull the nose back up, the conflict between the stabilizer and the elevator, <coughs> pardon me, jammed up the adjustment so much that the pilot could not overcome, uh, could not adjust this with you turning the manual trim adjustment wheel. So the pilots decide to turn power back on in order to adjust the trim. And at that case, and uh, sorry. So apparently the correct procedure is they know that this can happen, they tell pilots to put the nose down, take the stress off, and then you can turn the manual stabilizer or the manual trim adjust. Uh, but when you're that close to the ground, I'm not sure if they knew or what was going on. So with the power back on, the pilots did manage to somewhat correct the trim. They entered a new trim adjust, but the trim adjust activated MCAS again, waits a few seconds, takes in data, still sees that the, it thinks the plane has an angle of attack of 75 degrees and puts the nose down. And the pilots are unable to overcome this trim setting by controlling just the elevators, which is the small part at the end of the, the stabilizers there. Again, the plane pitched nose down and hit the ground at a high angle, high rate of speed. All 157 people on board died. This is the best I could come up with for their altitude, which doesn't tell a whole lot, but it obviously did not get very high. Uh, but the crew commands, trim up, MCAS says trim down. They turned it off, could not get control, turned it back on, gave a couple adjustments, uh, but then MCAS took over again and put the, the stabilizer back down. So grounding. Again, the 52 federal regulators grounded the 737 MAX prior to the FAA doing it. March 18th is when the FAA grounded them, all 387 MAXs that were in service. And it took until November 18th, 2020, for the FAA to ground, to be convinced that all those problems were solved. Longest grounding of any US manufactured airline. So fixes. The fixes are what the problems are we, we identified. Pilots have been told about it and trained in it. They know how the 737 MAX handles and they know about the MCAS system. MCAS has those rationality checks to make sure that it's getting consistent data between the two, as well as checking if the, the data is in a believable range. It's limited to how much it can adjust the trim and it can only adjust the trim once. So those problems, are addressed. So parting thoughts before I let you away with this. If you get into air accident investigation, it's kind of a double-edged sword. So on one side, you, uh, you, you see some of the best science in tracking down, tracking down and investigating what caused the problem. On the second side, now, when an accident happens, it's not just one thing that goes wrong. There's a whole series of things that go wrong. So if you just look at the crashes, there are a whole chain of events that cause that problem. And knowing all of those bad things 
It can be terrifying because you think bad things happen all the time. Please also focus on the, that all of the things are in a chain of events. And if any one of those chains is broken, the accident would not have happened. That's why aircraft flying, uh, passenger flight is so safe. So that's it. Let's open up the discussion and first start talking about the, any questions about the 737 MAX disasters. And I'm hoping I gave people a good, uh, a good check on what was going on here. Wow, thank you, Gavin. That was amazing. Okay. So do you wanna uh, turn off your uh, share oh. screen? Yeah. So we can see people? Let's, there's that stop share. There we go. Okay, hey. terrific. Okay. So. so Oh, that was tough. I, I hope that oh. that was clear. Um, were there any questions then? Oh, I see Larry has a question. So I was wondering, did, uh, uh, what sort of consequences does, has Boeing uh, faced uh, due to not telling the FAA about things, not telling the pilots about things? Yada, yada, yada. yada Did yada. anybody lose their job for murdering those people? <laughs> That's yeah. something I uh, I know that uh, I, I went, didn't go quite down those that path very, uh, very far. But I understand that there was a civil suit from the airlines that lost planes and the people that lost passengers. And there was a rather large settlement on on that. Uh, as for criminal charges, I'm not aware of anything. And again, I didn't go down that. But you're touching on a, a good topic here, because this is a story I tried to tell very deliberately without placing blame. So that's probably uh, an unsatisfying aspect of this story. <laughs> However, by not putting blame, that lets you get the whole, uh, the whole story in and all of the information before making a decision. So Good question, Larry, thanks. Peter, I see you have a... Uh, yeah, so um, I, it's kind of similar, but I'm curious, like when you say Boeing, like didn't tell their own engineers and how were they able to, so are you saying that were, it, are you, was it only an elite group that, that knew about the problem and um, was was there any kind of buddy who tried to be a whistleblower and say like, hey, this doesn't look safe. We need to kind of like with the challenger thing or. Okay, that is an excellent question, Peter. And there's one thing that I took out of the presentation that was probably my, my favorite aspect of this. So Boeing headquarters has always been in Seattle and the headquarters has always been attached right to a manufacturing plant. In the year 2000, Boeing CEOs and senior management pulled a publicity stunt in which they uh, got on a plane, filed three flight reports, and uh, decided what in the or announced to the world while they're in the air what, what city they're going to land in. And Boeing chose to land in Chicago, and it is thousands of miles away from its nearest manufacturing plant. And Boeing's CEO's excuse for that at the time was that they didn't want to get sucked into the day-to-day -day operations. So I would suggest that that is, again, I'm, I'm, I'm saying uh, uh, that's my opinion here, that, that's, that there's good reasons for that, but Boeing's culture has always been, it's an engineer's company. So everyone used to always be able to get access to the senior management and the management knew what they were talking about. I think that there's, there are stories of people that have brought up issues, uh, but I think the management culture or the culture at Boeing had shifted at that point to, <clears throat> uh, this, is the, this is the answer we want, go do it. We're not wanting to hear you talking about why it can't be done. If you're saying it can't be done, you're not a team player. So, wow. so that's some of the stories that I've heard and it's hard to classify any of those as fact. However, 
you've asked a really good question that does fill in some of the details there. Does that answer your question, Peter? Yeah, that's uh, interesting. Thank you. Stephen. Hello, Gavin. Thanks for a very interesting presentation. Uh, one of the questions that Peter asked about what happened, I forgot the name of the previous CEO. I think he was forced into retirement and then the chair of the board took over. Now, to add insult to the injury was the former CEO who was overseeing this whole fiasco on the development of the 737 MAX got a golden handshake of $65 million for creating this disaster. So in fact, I don't think anybody ever was prosecuted or anybody went to jail, okay? But the CEO got rewarded for $65 million parachute and uh, he's living his uh, well-earned life right now. <laughs> I don't doubt that. And, and one of the things, again, that I wanted to put in there is that uh, I, I told a long and convoluted story the second time. Mm -hmm. And there were lots of times in there that uh, there was an opportunity to intervene in what was going on. Mm -hmm. Like one of the obvious ones for Boeing is they knew in, in 2006 that they're going to need a better airplane. Mm -hmm. And at that point, they had 10 years to beat Airbus. Mm -hmm. So if they can create the 747 in 18 months, why did they not have the foresight to uh, get ahead uh, and get a new airplane when they knew it was needed? Yeah. Or even just rejig the 757 to uh, make it a more suited for, for this market. Yeah. Uh, there's a few other interesting things, actually. Uh, for quite a few years, we had uh, at Mount Royal, we had very close relationship with uh, WestJet. So WestJet, for many years, when they started, they flew only one type of plane. That was the Boeing 737 next generation. Yep. So, so WestJet exclusively only have the 600, 700, and 800 series. And I talked students to the WestJet hangar quite a few number of times. So we actually went to the maintenance center, look at the 737 and talk to the mechanics. And there were quite a few interesting things that came out. The mechanics actually said, this is a 50 year old design, reinvent n number of times. So on the outside, it looks nice, but if you crawl inside the plane, and I remember one of the mechanics took me and look, we actually crawl inside the underbelly of a 737 between the two main landing gear. And you open up and go inside and look at it. It got all the very ugly hydraulic pipes, pumps and valves right there. So this plane is flown by hydraulic. Now the A320 is the new design, which is fly by wire. Yeah. It's a total different generation. So this one is like 50 years old and they are still re-engineering it. So it, it, you, you can only you know, do so much with the old donkey. Yeah. Okay. So, so, uh, so there was nothing wrong with that original design for the next generation that was actually quite safe. Mm -hmm. But part of what made the Airbus uh, a superior product mm -hmm. is when you have fly-by-wire technology, mm -hmm. a lot of that complication and weight comes mm -hmm. out. That's so, right. So that's yep. part of what made the A320 a better plane that kind of leapt ahead. That's so right. So in the wide body, there's the 747 that mm -hmm. still has that old design. Yeah. But the 767, 77, and 87 planes are all new generation fly-by-wire. That's right. And yeah. yeah uh, so and Boeing has it, it's not as a company stuck in that old world. My mm -hmm. point here is that it seemed to be stuck with the old design because there are thousands of those. Yeah. And if you have the planes at, in, in service trying to get uh, trying to get something that replaces it, you don't want to have a plane in a city and no pilot to fly it or no mm -hmm. mechanics that, yeah. that know how to work on it or don't have the parts in stock to change it. it it's it's a 
a big cost savings. So it's not just Boeing here. There's a lot of pressure uh, from industry that got them, that got everyone into this situation. It doesn't mean that someone should not have made a better decision along the way, but I hope to tell the story in such a way that there was a lot of factors at play here, and it's not just a simple point at the CEO and say he should have done jail time. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing, um, somebody also asked, and, and this is quite interesting, is I remember I actually flew in a 737 back in the uh, 70s. That was a 737-200, the one you show in the photo. Yeah. And, and it feels larger, so close to the ground. In fact, the ladder is carried by the plane. So it's portable. Actually, you don't need ground like you know, those. You need a truck with the, the ladder. Yeah. The 737 at that time don't. The ladder will extend out and it will actually fold. So it's yeah. self-supported. So okay. the curious question was, well, if it's so close to the ground, what about the undercarriage? Can you actually redesign the landing gear, make it so that it's a bit longer and then the plane's ground clearance will be higher like the a320 why uh, wasn't that done okay they, yeah. i could not find any specific mm -hmm. answer for that but uh -huh. i think that the answer is once you have to do the changes to to lengthen the the landing gear i mean they mm -hmm. fold up and they go together yeah they they run out of room that way. If you're going to change the design and the structure of how the plane is supported, mm -hmm. you are no longer doing an upgrade to the plane. It's more of a, a complete change that requires the full certification of a new plane. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know, but I suspect that that's the, the part that goes into it because why wouldn't Boeing have done that rather than they got an, an aircraft manufacturers to redesign engines to be smaller but they're less efficient and less powerful because they had to fit under the 737. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Stephen, can I, can I sure. get back to a few other questions here? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Jim, Thanks. I think you've been patient here. Jim. You're on mute there. There. Now I'm unmuted. There okay. we go. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. That's that. Um, Let's see, MCAT or MCAS, the, uh, anyway, the automatic trim thing. Now that was designed to be able to handle the massive variations in, in the weight of the aircraft on this fuel, on this airborne fuel tanker thing. Correct. Yeah. So, uh, and there is a little bit of issue with the normal fuel usage, but it's, but, but it's not nearly as big an issue? Correct. I mean, it's refueling an airplane is kind of like refueling a car. You pull up, you go, you're attached for a few minutes, and it's thousands of kilograms of fuel that are transferred in that short time. Yeah. So that's, that's a lot of fuel that comes out of the KC-46 or the tanker. And the fuel, there's more weight in fuel uh, in the plane than what the plane empty weighs. Yeah. So, so that's a, a big change in what trim has to be done. So MCAS was set up as part of an autopilot to keep the tanker flying straight and level while the, the fighters or the bombers or whatever else yeah. fueled yeah. up. But it's, but, but it's a, a fairly minor issue for uh, an aircraft that is merely using, uh, using up uh, over several hours. Right. Yes. Uh, now, I have seen, well, a bit about people trying to develop electric airplanes. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, now, the, uh, now, from what I've heard, one of the very few possibilities for a battery that can come somewhere close to the energy per liter or kilogram of jet fuel is the uh, lithium air battery. So Jim, and, uh, which kind of taking not... us outside the scope of the, this oh, question. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, but the, uh, there's a little complication that it increases with weight as it, as it discharges. Okay. So, 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 so I'm just kind of curious whether, the, whether, that, whether that would, uh, make, uh, whether this adjusting trim and such like would be more, any more complicated for an increase of weight as the flight, as the flight goes on. 
I, I do not know. I do know that uh, yeah. like one of the reasons the 747 and the Airbus 380 actually are not are 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 are, are being phased out mm -hmm. is that they're capable of going insane flights like any from one point in the world to basically any other point in the world yeah. and they can do it but they have to carry so much fuel and so much more fuel to carry the fuel yeah. that it doesn't make sense not to 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 stop and refuel wherever there are because like if you're going from new york to singapore why not stop in lax and refuel yeah. uh, so that's those are some of the factors that are are going into apparently airplane route selection yeah well i i, I know that early on the uh there was a lot of stopping to refuel at Gander, Newfoundland, and, and Shannon, Ireland. Yep, and that was uh, that was set up like if the like the seven hundred and seven could handle the transatlantic flight, but if it suffered a headwind, it might run out of fuel and need to stop sooner. So, yeah. so that those stops were regularly part of it, uh, yeah. but are less less regular now yeah so yeah so yeah, yeah. So, the, so so the planes a little later had the fuel tankage to handle directly from london to new york or vice versa oh yes 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 and those are the larger generally those are the larger planes so yeah. not the 737 narrow body class anymore anyways yeah so i was also yeah someone else I was have also, a question I, here jim yeah, I was also going to ask Stephen's question about the uh, about the uh, the wheels. <laughs> <laughs> Hope I, well, I answered. Let's wait until everybody else is yeah, there. So this is a, but, coming but, up on but nine o'clock here. That, so <clears> I'll <throat> uh, I'll just uh, mute myself now. Okay. Hi. Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Oh, good. Well, so first of all, thank you, Gavin. It was so. Great presentations, very detailed. I haven't paid much attention at all for the, you know. <laughs> I, I hope you got something out of it. Oh yeah, yeah, I learned a lot. Actually, I didn't know anything. I don't, I didn't know anything about airplane. Actually, I learned something. But actually, uh, somebody asked about if this uh, charges inside, you know, about this for the uh, for the Boeing. I just went to Google. I just found out some information about it. Maybe just share it with everybody. Yeah. It says here that Boeing is to pay uh, two point five billion settlement that i think that that does ring a bell i have seen yeah. that but i didn't i deliberately again didn't go down that path because yeah. i wanted to focus on the technical matters which you can right. wrap that around as opposed to the legal matters that seem nebulous depending on how high up the corporate ladder you are yeah and also funny thing that's you know 2.5 billion 1.7 billion goes to the uh the airline air, airlines yeah and only 500 million goes to the the uh, families so yeah. and and also i didn't realize that they they admit the criminal misconduct but they don't plead guilty for the charges <laughs> so and you know it's, it's so that you know the government is okay and give you a settlement so if you pay 2.5 billion in the next three years we're, we're gonna charge. We're gonna to drop the charges. So that means the Boeing can still get the uh, contract from the government. Yeah, there's talk about this. There's this all kinds amazing. of craziness in there. Crazy. Uh, yes, and and again, I stayed out of the the legal ramifications of this because that's right. something that that has a different skill set for understanding and explaining that. And right. My law degree is from Wikipedia, and I have lawyers as friends, and I, 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 they humor me, and I know that they humor me, and we play by a, a very basic set of rules, and, and I've learned my place. Right. Anything else? Absolutely. Yeah, I just it made me so angry. You know, they they can you know get away with it, still get a contract with all the five hundred lives of. So, so uh, let me ask you a question here. Uh, I told this as a way of trying to get a whole bunch of information across. And there was a lot of points that we could place blame. Were you able to take in the whole story or did you glom onto certain parts there and, and stay focused on there? That's where the blame is that, you know, stop it, get them, get the bad guy. No, no, I, I listened to the whole, whole story. Okay. I listened to the whole story. Okay. And, Cause that's uh, one thing I deliberately yeah. tried to do was yeah. tell this in a, a fact neutral way 
because yeah. I think there is a lot of nuance in this from, you know, the 737 was built in a completely different era, different technology. It was not the prestige aircraft of the time. Uh, you know, Pan Am went under shortly after this. It, well, mm -hmm. it went under in, I think, 1980. But they were under that old thinking of the jet set lifestyle, major city to major city. And I think they neglected a big chunk of the market that, that does drive air travel. So I think a lot of the smart money kind of ignored uh, where the, A uh, the, the Boeing 737 was coming from in the niche it filled. And it turned out right. that it really did sneak up and be a very important aircraft in the industry. And a lot of people missed that. Yeah, I'm just wondering if, what if they had informed FAA about these changes? Uh, well, what I think the, would they I think the quite obvious that? thing is if the plane handles that differently, then that opens up a whole nother set of, uh, of criteria for it. The FAA right. can say that this is a different type and training mm -hmm. a pilot on a different type, mm -hmm. even if like mechanically it's all the same. If you have to train a pilot on that, they, they, they certainly don't get trained and certified with 20 minutes on an iPad. That's and that right. is a significant uh, headache for industry yeah. for pilots, a lack of selling feature. Like that's one of those things that could make an airline say, you know what, this is so much work and the A320 is already a better airplane. Uh -huh. Why don't we forget about the, the Max and go for the Neo? Right. And you don't know, so many of those little things could factor into that decision. And I suspect that Boeing was really dependent on sales of the, a, uh, of the 737 because that's the majority of their airplanes. Right. They got sucked into, a lot of people got sucked into that. And Boeing yeah. made decisions they shouldn't have because they, could, they were afraid of the consequences. Yeah, yeah. I see DD well, has a question you. here and we're running out of time. Can we, uh, can we, did I answer your question? Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Gavin, thank you. Thank you very much. DD. So I'm going to total, totally lighten it up here, but I wonder how many of you know about the pop, pop culture reference of the Lion Air disaster. No. So Tom Girardi is the lawyer for the, the Lion Air victims, the family's victims. And so he settled a huge lawsuit, huge lawsuit, won, won the lawsuit. And Tom Girardi is a California lawyer who became famous in the Aaron Brockovich, uh, you know, the contaminated water. So if you watch the film of Aaron Brockovich, Tom Girardi is her lawyer. So he's famous, he's uh, involved in the lawsuit. He wins the Lion Air 737 mm -hmm. lawsuit, but steals all of the money. And what's further interesting in pop culture is his wife is a Beverly Hills housewife. And so she's famous for, um, you know, they go on all these trips, right? But she takes her glam squad. She spends up to $45,000 a month being beautiful. And she has literally been funded by Tom Girardi and has really virtually been complicit in stealing all of the money from the Lion Air victims settlement. So this is really current. It's really huge. And it's really, um, it, it's all coming together now because he is, he is saying, and she is saying, oh, he's now got Alzheimer's and can't remember any of this. Um, so anyway, it's just kind of interesting that this was uh, okay. the topic of discussion and you know, kind of hurt my brain, all of this talk, but I thought, oh, this, this other part of it is very interesting. <laughs> interesting. So, so let me, uh, let me see, because this is one of those things that I think I'm successful on, and let's just confirm that, is that I told a story and filled out a framework, and you got to see where your interest fit within that. Absolutely. So now you're, I think, I'm reading into it, and please correct me, is that this was useful because it provided a framework that you can add more details to. Stephen also asked about this, like, who's responsible? Have there been right. criminal charges? I think that's, right. that's something that's definitely of interest, but until you know what goes on behind it, you don't really know, have a feeling for, like, you want the bad guy to pay, 
Mm -hmm. But until you know what went on, you don't really know what their what culpability they actually have. So but it really ties it, into your premise, uh, you know, as you put it out on on the blurb, we can reason blurb, you know, telling the story, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the way you tell the story. But when you have this other part of it, you think, oh, those were the victims, and that's what happened okay. in that other, right? Okay. Yep. It helps tie things together. And yeah. I think one of the things that stories does is facts without any context, you, we don't have meaning and significance to it. But once we tell a story, uh, those, those facts, the situations, the occurrences, they have meaning, significance. You have a much deeper understanding of what it is. And it resonates with you on an emotional level. Like that first story I told, those four, four bullet points, I think everyone here probably can memorize it. You can go to a cocktail party and if anyone asks what happened, you can recite those four points. But does it mean anything to you? And I would suggest it probably doesn't. And I want to jump into this again. Part of what my purpose of that first story is that I kind of broke the promise in this about talking in plain language. I used angle of attack and, and stall and MCAS and used an acronym when I'm only having four bullet points. Like I suspect that people felt cheated and a bit angry after the first story. And that was part of my point here is that that wasn't a very good story because it was just four packs, four points put together. And here you are, if you don't know what to do with it, well, that's your problem. Versus the second story, I went to a lot of trouble to give a lot of background and tie it to something that I think everyone can relate to. So I'm hoping that that's a takeaway you take from this. I realize we're running out of time, so I'm just dumping this out to, ahead. So that was part of my point is that um, I hope that people could see that there's a difference between stories that help convey technically complicated information in a way that's meaningful to you. And all of yeah, these- you nailed it. You nailed it. It was really good, Gavin. So in as far as I was successful, and I'm not setting myself up as a great storyteller, but I think that some of those key points that I kept in mind, like stick to the facts. I know we like blame. That's what we love. Who's the bad guy? Who are the heroes? How did the, the hero get, uh, get smacked down? Did they ever come back? Those are the stories we like, but that kind of helps keep us away from the truth because if you go down that path, you're not actually taking in all of the information to, to make that decision on. So, so thank you, Grant. I, I, I'm glad I was successful at accomplishing that. And I hope that gave everyone a bit of an understanding of what this happened, but also for else other stuff, is how do you put these things in context? Because if you, someone, if you ask a technical question and someone gives you a story like my first one of here's four bullet points, what do you do with that? I think I gave enough detail that everyone here is asking intelligent questions and everyone else knows where those questions are coming from because that story created a structure, a framework, a narrative that helps tie it all together. So anyone, anything that anyone has brought to the questions or adding additional information after the fact, it seems like everyone else, I hope, knows where that fits in and how it all ties together. And we're all having one conversation here instead of separate conversations about, you know, someone knows X and someone else knows Y, but you don't know how X and Y come together. Yeah. I think this is something that ties that together. That's part of that community. And like Lois said, it either builds communities or you can tear them apart with the power of story. Okay, so. Larry, Larry, do you have something? Larry, you're muted. Do you have a question? Your hand's up there, Larry. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was just going to mention that uh, the U.S., I don't know whether this is true of any other country, but the U.S. has uh, uh, declared that companies are, are, are people. That was and they have the yes. same, same rights as people. Well, I'll believe that when they uh, handcuff the company, close it right down, and <laughs> keep it closed down for 10 years and don't let them sell any of the material they've got in the company yep. <clears throat> until yep. after the 10 years is up. That does seem like a ridiculous thing, but 
And, and you case. know, a company like that, if it's a, an error in the design, someone should be going to jail. And, and well, just, just, just to mention one, one quick thing here, that's not the only company that's gotten away with murdering people. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, company that made all of the oxycodone and all that kind of stuff, uh, it's run by a family and uh, they negotiated paying billions of dollars over 10 years without any uh, charges against themselves. Mm. Yep. But that's not gonna cost them a damn thing because over those 10 years, they can pay out that stuff easy, yep. right? So, yep, there's lots of, lots of things that, can, that come from this. And one of the personal things, like me being a participant now, rather than the, the person talking, one of the things I glommed on to is that how long it took the FAA to ground the 737 MAX and how many other uh, national uh, federal regulators grounded the plane first. And I think that tells a bit of a story in there about Donald Trump being president and the world stopping to trust or trusting the US less about all of their technical expertise and everything the US has been wonderfully good at for decades uh, people aren't trusting what's coming out uh, because it's not, they, they, they worry it might be tainted by political considerations that has not been there in the past. So there's lots of, lots of little stories that can kind of be glommed on to this. And once you know, once we have that framework, again, everyone else knows how those stories tie into the grander story. <laughs> Well, Gavin, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was very good. Yeah. Well, thanks, I Gavin. This, and I did it for my own my own benefit. And I, I spent a lot of time, you know, going down Wikipedia articles and other, you know, magazine articles and stuff from, uh, I tried to get stuff that was from reputable sources mm -hmm. on the internet, but I did not get to the point of actually having a bibliography or a, a footnotes for all this. So again, not an aircraft engineer, not aeronautics. I'm just kind of passionate about it. So amazing. Well, thank thank that, you very much. Thanks, Gavin. Gavin. Thanks, thank Gavin. You very much. We love okay. you for it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Good night. Good night, everybody. Everyone. Thank night. you very much. Everybody. Bye, bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Well, well done, Lois. Thank you. <laughs> <Bye>. Yeah. <laughs>